Joshua chapter 8. Um, I think I introduced myself, but my name is Paul Clemens. I'm one of the pastors here at Calvary Chapel of Prescott. I get to step in for Pastor Raj, our senior pastor, who is off this weekend. Um, some of you might know he, he had been not feeling well. He was a little under the weather. He's still got a little bit of chest congestion and a, and a cough and stuff, but that had no bearing on him uh, not being here. It was just the normal, the normal uh, uh, rotation. Uh, at the end of the year here. So um, keep him in your prayers. Uh, he, he's doing well, but he, he could be totally healed, right? So that's what we're praying for. Um, so Joshua chapter 9, um, finish the announcements. I'm going to go ahead and pray uh, before we even get into the introduction and start. Because um, I think that's that's a good thing. So, dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we, uh, we thank you for this day. We just thank you for this time and the opportunity to be here. Lord, we thank you for the truth of your word. We just ask that uh, as we open it up, Lord, that you would uh, convict and comfort and give peace and challenge uh, whatever, whatever it is that we need. Lord, you know it, and uh, so that's what we ask for. Lord, I ask that... Um, that those that uh, wouldn't call you Savior, that haven't accepted you as their, as their Savior, that they would um, be changed today. Lord, we uh, know that uh, you can do things like that. You can do uh, amazing things. A person may have walked in here uh, with one thing on their mind and then just totally convicted by your Holy Spirit, Lord, and they, they change their life for the better. And so, uh, Lord, we, we pray for that. We pray for um, you being honored and glorified. We pray that um, you just bless this time that we have together. Bless uh, all the other things going on right now in the other areas of this campus. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So as we start in... Joshua chapter 9, the, before this, you know, uh, the children of Israel have crossed over into the land that God has promised them. Uh, they are to move forward in the promises of God. They were to prepare themselves, prepare their hearts for the work that God was going to do through them uh, and in them. They are to trust in him for victory, in the Lord for victory, to be obedient to his word, be careful. They are to be careful to do all that is, or to do according to all that is written in it. They are to walk by faith. They are to not walk by sight. These are the things that, uh, as, as believers, we are to do as well. These are truths that can impact us in, in the here and now. Uh, what we found out throughout Joshua has been uh, important lessons for us. And as we continue in Joshua and this final day of 2023 and into 2024, this next year, we're going to learn more lessons and we will grow and we will mature in in Christ through his word. Now our lives are filled with one issue after another. I don't think I'm saying anything new to anybody in here. There are trials and there are difficulties along the way. We see this playing out in the lives of the Israelites as well. We see that there are days when things go right and then there are days when things go wrong. That happens to us as well. There are days when things are under control and then most days things are not. There are days when you're able to handle what comes your way and then there are days when you don't feel like you can. You feel overwhelmed and like you're drowning. So when things go right, praise the Lord. When things uh, go wrong, praise the Lord. It's good to remember that not everything will go according to plan. How many know that? 
1 Peter 4.12, Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing has happened to you. So if we are expecting it, whatever it is, it won't derail us, it won't uh, get us off uh, track, it won't put us in a place of ineffectiveness in our Christian walk. In fact, the Bible tells us this about trials and difficulties. James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience, that is endurance, that is perseverance. Let, but let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect, uh, that you may be mature um, and complete, lacking nothing. So ultimately, uh, the perfect work being done in our lives, the goal of being complete, lacking nothing, is part, it's part of the journey. It's part of our practice, which is to be headed in an upward direction to meet our position in Christ. And just like the Israelites, God had taken them from Egypt and brought them into the promised land. And here's what's happening. God is taking you and he's taking me from where we've been, and he's bringing us into a new place, into growth, into maturity, into a closer walk with him, into a relationship, a deeper relationship with him. And he will finish what he starts. That is just who our God is. He will finish what he starts. Philippians 1.6 tells us this, being confident of this very thing, that he who has began a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. And this is uh, the Old Testament version of Philippians 1.6. It's Psalm 138.8. It's the first part of that verse. It says, the Lord will perfect that which concerns me. It's the Lord that will perfect that which concerns me. He is working to grow and to mature us. And in both of these verses... Who's our hope to be in? Where's the hope at? Who's the confidence in? It's not in us, right? I can't say, uh, Paul, you started this, and I'm so uh, glad at, about what you're doing. I can't say that I started anything and actually actually finished it. I, I did, but I, I, I don't finish things in a timely manner sometimes. It says that the Lord began a good work. It says that the Lord will perfect or complete that which concerns us, his people. I'm so glad it's not up to me. And I'm so glad it's not up to you. So glad it's not based on my determination. It's not based on my resolve. So the hope and the the confidence is in the Lord to complete his work. And what I want to do is I want to do my very best with his strength, with his wisdom to cooperate with the work he is doing in me. And that's not, well, that's a lot easier said than done because what that requires is it takes humility It takes obedience, and that, like we've read, comes from difficulty, and it comes from trial. It comes from pressure. But the good thing is the Lord is not a quitter. He won't give up on you. He won't give up on me. Even though we may fail, he will never fail. And so as we Begin chapter 9, starting in verse 1, it says this, As soon as all the kings who were beyond the Jordan, in the hill country, and in the lowland, all along the coast of the great sea toward Lebanon, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites heard of this, they gathered together as one to fight against Joshua and Israel. So what we looked at last time in the last uh, portion of chapter 8, we saw what Joshua and the Israelites were doing. And while they were doing this, while Joshua and the people of Israel were 
at the base of Mount Ebal and at the base of Mount Gerizim, being obedient to and renewing their commitment with the Lord. There were several groups who had heard of what Joshua and the Israelites have done. They, they've heard that they are in the land and have taken out Jericho and they have taken out Ai. They know that God has given the promised land to Israel. And so they are making plans to come together. They are making plans to form a coalition and fight against Joshua and the people of Israel. And really what they're doing is they are fighting against God and his plans, which isn't anything new. It's happened in the past. Um, it happens right now in the future. Uh, it, it will continue to happen. And one day, the Lord will take care of it. But Psalm 2, 1 and 2 says this, Why do the nations rage and the people plot a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. To fight against the Lord is an empty, it's a worthless thing. It makes no sense. You will not win. Many have done it, but all will come to the same conclusion and will come to confess the truth. Philippians 10, or correction 2, 10 and 11 say that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. There's something better than to fight against the Lord and that is to bow the knee now instead of later. In Joshua 9, we come to verse 3, and it says, But when the inhabitants of Gibeon heard what Joshua had done to Jericho and to Ai, they on their part acted with cunning and went and made ready provisions and took worn-out sacks for their donkeys and wineskins, worn out and torn and mended, with worn-out patches, sa patched sandals on their feet, and worn out clothes, and all their provisions were dry and crumbly. Verse 6, And they went to Joshua in the camp of Gilgal, and said to him, and to the men of Israel, We have come from a distant country, so now make a covenant with us. But the men of Israel said to the Hivites, Perhaps you live among us, then how can we make a covenant with you? They said to Joshua, We are your servants. And Joshua said to them, Who are you, and where do you come from? And they said to him, From a very distant country, your servants have come, because of the name of the Lord your God. For we have heard a report of him, and all that he did in Egypt, and all that he did to the two kings of the Amorites, who were beyond the Jordan, to Sihon the king of Heshbon, and Og the king of Bashan, who lived in Ashtaroth. Verse 11, so our elders and all the inhabitants of our country said to us, take provisions in your hand for the journey and go to meet them and say to them, we are your servants. Come now, make a covenant with us. Here is our bread. It was still warm when we took it from our houses as our food for the journey on the day we set out to come to you. But now, behold, it is dry and crumbly. Verse 13, these wineskins were new. When we filled them and behold, they have burst and these garments and sandals of ours are worn out from the very long journey. So here we're introduced to the terrible neighbors. The inhabitants of Gibeon who are actually Hivites. We saw that in verse seven. who after hearing about the true and the living God and seeing what he had done through Joshua and the Israelites at Jericho and at Ai, instead of uh, being a part of this coalition that was going to come against Israel and fight, and fight them, and they weren't like Rahab and her family who put their faith in, 
and trust in the one true God. They chose to, to scam the Israelites. They chose to put together this elaborate fraud scheme to get what they wanted. I remember being a police officer, and I was always amazed at the effort that people would go through to conduct their criminal activity. Sometimes it was pretty elaborate for not much gain. I always thought if they would have just put that same effort into something that was legitimate, they would, you know, have, have made a good living. They, they would have not had to worry about looking over their shoulders and ending up in jail. But here's, here's a little background. We read in Deuteronomy chapter 7. We read about this, these instructions that um, the children of Israel had been given before they entered the land. And it says this, When the Lord your God brings you into the land that you are entering to take possession of it, and clears away many nations before you, the Hittites, the Girgashites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, seven nations more numerous and mightier than you. And when the Lord your God gives them over to you and you defeat them, then you must devote them to complete destruction. You shall make no covenant with them and show no mercy to them. And so as the Israelites entered the promised land, they had been given Specific instructions, we, we saw that in the last study as well. They've, they have been given and should be following these specific instructions as they're in the land. We, we, saw, we saw in that passage there are seven nations that were to, to be devoted to destruction, and the Hivites were one of them. And uh, just a little bit of... More background, the Hivites were descendants of Canaan, and Canaan was the, the fourth son of Ham, one of Noah's sons. And the Hivites in the, in the land there had four main cities, Gibeon, Shepharia, Beeroth, and kirjath Jerim. See that, we'll see that in verse 17. But these inhabitants of uh, Gibeon were no doubt cunning, uh, just as verse 4 said, uh, they were sly, they were sneaky, uh, they were tricky, they were shifty. Um, you know, you probably have your own word to put in there for people like this. And before you, you look at them and maybe even admire this, this plan, this complicated plan that they that they came up with. Let's look at it for what it is. It's, it's deception. It's, it's a flat out lie. The inhabitants of Gibeon, this is a very accurate statement. The inhabitants of Gibeon are liars. And they go to great lengths to reinforce, reinforce this lie and get themselves out of this trouble that they find themselves in. And they first lied about where they were from, and not once, but twice. They said that they were from a distant country. We saw that in verse 6. And after that initial introduction, when they came to Gilgal, to, to the leaders in, in Joshua, the leaders had a little bit of a suspicion, you know, they, that they might not be telling the truth, that they might actually be their neighbors are living among them. And if they did, and if they were, they, they couldn't make a covenant with them. And Joshua, he asked some follow-up questions. He continued and asked them specific questions that they didn't answer, right? He said, who are you and where do you come from? They said, from a very distant country. That was in verse 9. Not just a distant country like they said the first time, but 
Now it's a very distant country. And this was a lie because Gibeon was only approximately 20 miles away from Gilgal. And next they lied about their clothing and they lied about their food. They said when they left their homes, the bread that they had was fresh and it was warm right out of the oven. But now, because of the very long journey, look, look at it for yourselves. It is dry and it's crumbly. They use the word behold which is a a more emphatic word when you want somebody to look at something. I think of um, John the Baptist, behold the Lamb of God who, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. That's uh, an emphatic word. You really want people to look at it. And there they are. Behold, look at it it for yourself, our bread. It was hot. It was was warm. It was so good then. But now it's just dry and it's crumbly. They said, look at at the wineskins that we have. Here's some more evidence. They were new when we filled them, and now they have burst. They're old. They're worn out. They said, look at our clothing. Look at our sandals. They have worn out because of this very long journey. The very long journey that we've been on. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. This very long journey. Everything that we have, it's, it's worn out, and, and we barely... We barely made it here. They probably took the very best actors. They all had acting lessons. They took the very best actors to be in this scheme. It was an elaborate lie. And everything they did, the way they looked, what they said, it was all false. Everything they said, everything they had done, it was done to manipulate. It was done to sell this lie. You're a parent, you know all about it. They then lied about themselves. They made it seem like they were these ambassadors from their country who had come on a peace mission. They also said, we are your servants. And they weren't anything, they were not servants. They were anything but, they were enemies of Israel. And if all these lies weren't enough and In all that they said, they began to talk about the Lord. They started to say things that they knew the Israelites wanted to hear. They said that uh, we have come because of the name of the Lord your God. We've heard about him. We heard about all that he's done in Egypt. What he did to the two kings of the Amorites. They said this not because they were in awe and wanted to worship him or had any reverence for him, but because it would help them in their scheme. It would further their ruse, which would ultimately get them what they wanted. You'll notice the reason they are there is because of what happened to Jericho and what happened in Ai. But if they were to mention what happened in Jericho and happened to Ai, that would have blown their cover because that was too recent. There was no way that they would have known about that if they were really, truly from a very distant country. This isn't something that that just happened uh, on a whim in the moment, it, it was thought out, it was planned, it was meant to, to look a certain way, it was meant to sound a certain way, it was meant to smell a certain way. I'm sure they didn't bathe for a long period of time to make it seem like they were on this very long journey. It 
was meant to accomplish a certain thing. It was meant to trick them into a covenant with them. Now, the inhabitants of Gibeon, they knew that they would be next on the list to be destroyed. You might ask yourself, you know, why this specific deception? Where did they come up with this? Now, we read about the nation, we read about the nations in Deuteronomy uh, chapter 7 that were devoted to destruction, one of them being the Hivites. Now, we also read in Deuteronomy 20 uh, that the Israelites were given more specific instructions that if they were to be in conflict with or go into battle against cities that were far from them, this is what they were supposed to do. Deuteronomy 20, starting in verse 10, it says, When you draw near to a city to fight against it, offer terms of peace to it. And if it responds to you peaceably and it opens to you, then all the people who are found in it shall do forced labor for you you, and shall serve you. But if it makes no peace with you, it makes war against you, then you shall besiege it. And when the Lord your God gives it into your hand, you shall put all its males to the sword. But the women, the little ones, the livestock, and everything else in the city, all its spoils, you shall take as plunder for yourself. And you shall enjoy the spoil of your enemies with which the Lord your God has given you. Thus you shall do to all the cities that are far from you, which are not cities of the nations here. So it appears that the Gibeonites knew a little bit about God's word. They knew this and they used it to come up with their strategy, the come up with their deception. And this should remind us of someone. This is something that we need to be aware of. And that is, we are just like the Israelites operating in enemy territory. We're not on a cruise ship enjoying the scenery. We're on a battleship. We're watching out for the missiles that are coming. We're not on a playground. We're on a battleground. Whatever analogy makes sense to you, whatever wakes you up, whatever gets you, gets your attention. Wake up in the morning and know you're in a fight. It won't be so shocking to you when you get punched in the face. Because Satan is a liar and he wants to destroy you. He wants to destroy your family. He wants to destroy your marriage. He wants to destroy your relationships. He wants to take your peace and your joy. He wants to strip you of anything good. He wants to replace it with deceit and deception and he wants it to masquerade as some form of truth he's pretty good at it but there is no truth in him whatsoever do you trust Jesus do you trust Jesus to give you the truth And listen to what he says about your enemy. In John chapter 8, verse 44, he was speaking to the Pharisees. But he says this, You are of your father the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning. He does not stand in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character. For he is a liar and the father of lies. That's who he is. Does your truth come from God's word? Does your truth come from the words of Jesus? Your truth come from what you think is right. What 
seems right. Jesus also said this in John 17, 17. It says, sanctify them by your, your truth. Your word is truth. We as believers are to be set apart from the world and put into God's service. This process of sanctification has been described as becoming more and more like Christ. And this isn't accomplished apart from the truth. In fact, it can only be done through the truth of God's word. When we read it, when we hear it, when we understand it, and when we apply it to our lives, there is lasting and there is meaningful change. Do you want to change? Are there things in your life that you need to change? That change, the transformation Jesus is speaking of is only found in his truth. We are not to operate in or rely on our own understanding. That's when we get into trouble. I won't ask you to raise your hand, but how many people have gotten into trouble because relied on your own understanding. Everybody's hand should be raised, right? We have not, when we get into trouble, we don't follow Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. And we see that's where Joshua and the leaders went wrong. We read it in verses 14. I'm going to read verses 14 and 15. So the men took some of their provisions. They took a look at some of the things that they had presented as evidence, but did not ask counsel from the Lord. And Joshua made peace with them and made a covenant with them to let them live, and the leaders of the congregation swore to them. There it is. They did not ask counsel from the Lord. You've been in our Wednesday night studies when Nate teaches. We're in Nehemiah. We see how things went well when when Nehemiah consulted the Lord. But they did not ask counsel from the Lord. They asked some follow-up questions. There was a suspicion at first. Something wasn't quite right. But then they evaluated everything in their own understanding. They evaluated the evidence presented to them. They could see it. They could touch it, hold it in their hands. They could smell it. They could taste it. They, they heard it. They heard the testimony of the Gibeonites. But they did not ask counsel of the Lord. And then they go into this, entered into this covenant with them without the Lord being in it. They did not ask counsel from the Lord. I I hope when I read that, I hope when you saw it on the screen or you looked at it in your Bible, that, that just jumps off the pages when we saw it, when we read it. I hope that there were flags, there were whistles, there were uh, bells going off when, when that was read. Because that was their problem. A lot of times this is our problem as well. If we're honest, as believers, we have the resource, but, but forget to or just don't use it. It's, it's there. It's available. It's counsel from the Lord. Most, time, most times our own senses, 
for what we can see, taste, touch, hear, and feel isn't enough to make the decisions that we need to make. So how do we make these, keep from making this mistake? How do we hear from the Lord and make the right decisions? How do we hear from the Lord and make the right judgments? How do we hear from the Lord as we leave 2023 and move into 2024? This is the last day. Well, here are a few things to consider when it comes to hearing from the Lord. First thing, we hear from the Lord through the counsel of his word. That shouldn't be a surprise. Psalm 119, 105, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. God's word not only shows us where to step to avoid the the pitfalls and to avoid the danger will show us the direction and will keep us on the right path. Psalm 32, 8. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. It's the Lord through his word that gives us counsel, that gives us instruction. 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, to live right in our walk. And I'm not going to talk about God's word without sharing this verse again with you. I think I've shared this verse every single Joshua study. And it's Joshua 1.8, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For uh, For then you will make your way prosperous and then you will have good success. Now, when it comes to the counsel of God's word, there are times when it is direct. For, for instance, You might ask yourself as a husband, do I need to love my wife? Does anybody not know the answer, you husbands out there? Well, the answer is absolutely, positively, yes. Well, how do you know? Well, Ephesians 5.25 directly tells me, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. And then there are times when it's not so, so direct and the counsel of God's word is provided in more of a biblical principle. I didn't finish my thought here. I meant to go back in my, in my study, but I never, I never made it back there. So I, wanna, I was going to put in here uh, an idea of maybe something not so direct, right? Indirect. Uh, counsel of, of God's word. And, you know, I, I thought of a few things. I thought of, uh, you know, how in the Bible it says um, physical instruction or physical, um, what am I thinking of? Physical. Physical training. That's what I'm thinking of. Physical training is of some value. The Bible says it is of some value. You know, so we're not going to. It says it's of some value. So, you know, if you're going to join a gym in 2024, you know, go ahead. It's okay. It's of some, it's of some value. Um, I know, you know, as we get older, we got to keep moving and that's, that's good for us. You know, so physical training is of of some value. Um, But we're not going to, you know, start the church of Calvary Prescott and physical training. Calvary Chapel of Prescott, physical training 
in excellence an aquatic center. We're not gonna we're not gonna do that based on on that in that verse. We're gonna simply use a make it a principle, right? Some some uh, some physical training is of of some value. Anyway, so you you get what I'm saying as far as direct and and kind of indirect or biblical principle. Second thing is we hear from the Lord through the reassurance of his peace. Colossians 3. I love Colossians 3. I go to it often. It is a useful chapter in our Christian lives. And in Colossians 3.15, it says this, And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. That word rule in Greek is, I, I totally messed this up, but if I say it enough, I'll, I'll get it. Brabao, brabao, brabao. Brabao, that's what it is. The word rule is brabao in Greek. And what that means is it, it has the idea of, of being an umpire to decide or to determine something. So the peace of God will help you in your life to decide or determine things. I'm not talking about this feeling in your gut. That could be something totally, totally different. But a person, the Bible says, a person can't really know peace outside of Christ. So it has to do with a relationship with Christ. Being in Christ and having his peace will help you make decisions. And it's all about being in Christ and having that relationship with him. Now, we've all heard this phrase, or maybe maybe you've said it, something along the lines of, I just don't have a peace about this thing or that thing. I don't have a a peace uh, about it. I I just have this check in my heart. I just have this check in my spirit. There's just something that makes me uncomfortable uncomfortable about uh, this situation, whatever situation it is, whatever it may be. If that peace from the Lord is not there, don't, don't move forward into making that decision. Maybe, maybe you wait. Well, you should wait. If you don't have peace from the Lord about a situation, don't continue to move forward. I think you'd be asking for trouble. But you might wait. You might seek God. You might pray about it. You might dig into his word. You might do all of those things. And and the next thing is we hear from the Lord through the confirmation of his people. You know, if you're married, husbands, you might ask your wife. You know, I was... I was talking to my wife and I was at, I was telling her that I was going to take up golfing. And she says, why do you want to do that? You got to wear two pairs of pants. I said, what do you mean? I got to wear two pairs of pants. She says, well, if you get a hole in one. <laughs> now, you know, I don't, I don't really care if you laugh or if you don't. I mean, I would rather you laugh. The Lord has given, he's given us humor, right? The Bible says, um, what's the Bible say? Uh, (laughs) The Bible says that laughter is good medicine. And uh, the Lord has given humor. He has given humor to, uh, in greater degree, to some than others. But in any event, that's, that's what it's for. It's good medicine for our soul to, to laugh. So we hear from the Lord through the confirmation of his, of his people. Proverbs eleven fourteen: where there is no counsel, the people fall. 
But in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. The Lord can use us as confirmation In many different ways. You may not even know that the Lord used you to confirm something in someone's life. It may be because uh, you're just being obedient to the Lord and you're acting it out in a way that people can see and that's all they needed as far as uh, their confirmation, uh, the confirmation that they needed for that particular thing in their life. You You may know because someone might have said something to you that confirmed what the Lord was already telling you. I remember a few years ago, it was March of 2018, I was on the verge of making a huge life-changing decision that would impact my, my wife and my children. And, and now as I look back, it would in, impact a lot of other people as well. You know, and I was, I was torn. I was worried. I didn't know how, how it would work. I didn't know how things would go. I didn't have all the answers. I remember hearing from God's word, and not just once, but over a period of time, but I, I resisted. I, I remember... I remember it like it was, it was yesterday. I remember being at a, the pastor's leaders conference in Tucson. Every year we go, it's always in March. And uh, a former pastor from Calvary Chapel of Prescott, Pastor Jim Thomas, he is now the senior pastor in Arcata, California at Telios Bible Church. He usually, there's been some years that he hasn't, but he usually meets us there. And I'm all, I always, we always have, you know, at least one conversation. And in this conversation I was having with him, I, I um, you know, had, had talked to him about what was going on. And my concerns and my resisting and my worry and all of, all of these things. And, uh, You know, he said a lot of other things, but there was one thing that really, really got me. And he had asked me a question, and the question was to elicit a response. It it was to remind me of a truth. I was... I was worried. I was worried about providing for my family. I was in a very good financial position at the time. But I knew that that wasn't where the Lord was calling me. And what he said, the question that he asked me was, don't you know, why do you doubt that the Lord loves you and he loves your family more than you? Don't you, do you think he won't provide? And so I had heard from the counsel of God's word. I had heard from the confirmation of a brother that I respected in Christ. And even though I didn't know everything, I didn't know all the steps, I didn't know how it would work, I had a peace. And I, I went in and I gave my two-week notice. I came to the church. I told Pastor Raj. All I knew was I was going to 
devote more time. I was leading the high school ministry at the time. Devote more time. I'm going to... I know that's what you want me to do. You've called me here, Lord. <clears throat> so I tell, I tell Pastor Rogers, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to find some part-time job. I'm going uh, to be here more. He's like, well, what if I hire you? <laughs> so I'm like, okay, I didn't, I didn't know. And he's provided and he's taking care of things. And it's, the Lord is good. Verse 16, at the end of these, at the end of three days after they had met or made a covenant with them, they heard that they were their neighbors and that they lived among them. And the people of Israel set out and reached their cities on the third day. Now their cities were Gibeon, Shephirah, Beeroth, Kariath, Jerim. But the people of Israel did not attack them. Because the leaders of the congregation had sworn to them by the Lord, the God of Israel, that all the congregation, then all the congregation murmured against the leaders. Verse 19, but all the leaders said to all the congregation, we have sworn to them by the Lord, the God of Israel, and now we have, now we may not touch them. This we will do to them. Let them live, lest wrath be upon us because of the oath that we swore to them. And the leader said to them, let them live. So they became cutters of wood and drawers of water for, the, for all the congregation, just as the leaders had said, to, said of them. So after three days, this all comes out in the open. It, it, it wasn't a, a secret anymore. The, de, the deception is known. We're not told how it was discovered, but somehow they heard the truth. This decision that the leaders made was not a popular one. Um, because it says that the congregation murmured or they, they complained against the leaders. I'm sure they didn't need the, the congregation to complain for them to realize they had made a mistake, that they had done the wrong thing. But because of what they had done, they, they were locked in. They entered into this covenant. They had sworn to them by the Lord, the God of Israel, that they would not be killed. They would not kill them. To go back on their word now would be to violate, would be a violation against the Lord and his name. On a side note, King Saul, he would violate this oath. And he would be judged for it. You can read about that in 2 Samuel chapter 21. So it's very important that they, they keep their word. It's very important that they kept their word. And Joshua kept his word, but there would be consequences to the Gibeonites for what they had done, and he would make them f slaves, forced labor. Verse 22, Joshua summoned them, and he said to them, Why did you deceive us, saying, We are very far from you when you dwell among us? Now, therefore, you are cursed, and some of you shall never be anything but servants, cutters of wood and drawers of water for the house of my God. They answered Joshua, Because it was told to our servants for a Cert, for a certainty that the Lord your God had commanded his servants Moses to give you all that the Lord give the give you all the land and to destroy all the inhabitants of the land bef from before you. So we feared greatly for our lives because of you and did this thing. Verse 25. And now behold, we are in your hand. Whatever seems good and right in your sight to do to us, do it. So he did this to them and delivered them out of the hand of the people of Israel. And they did not kill them. But Joshua made them that day cutters of wood and drawers of water for the congregation and for the altar of the Lord to this day in the place that he should choose. Now, the other important thing that I'd like to, to look at as we close this morning. The other thing that we see in, in this chapter, besides hearing from the Lord, is the importance of keeping, keeping your wor word. Now, I wouldn't say that these two things uh, are independent and separate, separate things from, from each other. Um, hearing from the Lord and um, keeping your word. 
because they're very much go hand in hand. Like I wouldn't say in every situation you have to keep your word. In fact, even though you were totally deceived and there was no way you could have known, um, that's not, I wouldn't say that. Because what was going on here in this chapter, the most important point is obviously to take counsel from the Lord. And had they have taken counsel from the Lord, they wouldn't be in the situation they were in. Because what was going on here is that the Israelites, they they should have known. They should have known. They could have asked counsel of the Lord and they wouldn't be in the situation they find themselves in right now. But since they went ahead and gave their their word, they're they're accountable to it. Here's what Jesus said, and and as followers of Christ, we need to reflect his character. In Matthew uh, chapter 5 and verse 37, it says, Let what you say be simply yes or no. Anything more than this comes from evil. Another Translation says, just let your yes be yes and your no be no. He's saying, just be true to your word because I'm true to mine. Be like me. There, there's no need to add extra words. Well, I swear to God, you know. Um, what's, that, what's that saying? Hope to die, stick a needle in my eye, or whatever, whatever that is. There's no need for extra words because your character should speak for itself. Psalm 145, 13. The Lord always keeps his promises. He is gracious in all he does. So it's important to keep our word. That's the character of God. That's the character of Jesus. We should reflect that character. And so here are some things, as, again, as we close, to consider when it comes to keeping our word. Don't speak uh, hastily or rashly. Think before you speak. It's not just what your mama told you. It's in the Bible. Ecclesiastes 5.2. Be not rash with your mouth, nor let your heart be hasty to utter a word before God. For God is in heaven and you are on earth. Therefore, let your words be few. What's that quote? You may, you may have heard it. I don't know. It's either attributed to Abraham Lincoln or it's attributed to Mark Twain. But it's this quote. It is better to remain silent and be thought a fool than to open your mouth and speak and remove all doubt. Not only think before you speak, but be careful with your words that you do speak. Weigh your words carefully. Proverbs 13, 3, whoever guards his mouth preserves his life. He who opens wide his lips comes to ruin. We're warned in the Bible to be careful with our words because words matter. Avoid exaggerations and overstatements and be careful when you use the words always and never. Do you always do something? Do you never do that other thing? Consider the words you use because you're doing one of two things when you speak. Proverbs 18, 21. Death and life are in the power of Of the tongue. You are either building someone up or you're tearing them down. And it's done through your words, through your speech. And the last thing be realistic with the promises you make. Ecclesiastes 5 5 It is better to say nothing than to make a promise and not keep it. You know, many things are out of our control. So it makes sense to not speak hastily and and to weigh our words before we make a promise. 
Keeping our word should not be this trivial thing because it ultimately it reflects uh, the character of God. And when we don't keep our promises, we tarnish the character of God. So in conclusion, as I ask the uh, worship team to come back up here, as we move into 2024, as we leave 2023, think about these two things in the year to come. The importance of hearing from the Lord and asking counsel of Him, and the importance of keeping your word. And both of those things, the most important thing when thinking of this depends on your relationship with the Lord. And if you haven't, if you don't have a relationship with the Lord, let me give you an opportunity this morning. It's my time to tell you how much God loves you. Whether you're here in the sanctuary, if you're, if you're watching online, whether you watch this two weeks from now, this is my opportunity to tell you that God loves you. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter where you've been. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter how bad your past is. This is what the Bible says. It's in John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Jesus came to this earth. He lived a sinless life. He went to the cross as a substitute for you and for me. And he didn't, nobody had to drag him. He didn't go grudgingly. Hebrews 12, 2, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. For the joy that was set before him, that was you and that was me. And because he loves you so much, he wants to give you a free gift. He wants to give you a gift of salvation. It's a hope and it's an assurance of a relationship with him forever. And it's through the the shed blood of Jesus and his finished work on the cross. You know, that, that wasn't the end. He rose from the dead. He he proved that he has conquered sin and death. And it's a gift for anyone who would receive it just by faith. And so is that you this morning? As we bow our heads and close our eyes and I just want to, if that's you this morning, if I just want to Relay the importance of this is the day. Don't wait any longer. This is the time. Today is the day. It's not a magical prayer. I just want to lead you in a prayer of faith. And it's just this, Father in heaven, I know how much you love me. The proof is that you gave your only son who died on the cross for me. He took my place. He paid my debt. I know there's nothing that I could do on my own So I realize that I'm a sinner and I'm separated from you. And I believe that you, Jesus, the only one that could pay that debt. I believe you rose from the dead. You conquered sin and death. And you want a relationship with me forever. And so I, by faith, receive your free gift of salvation. Change me, guide me, direct me. 
Help me to live a life that brings glory and honor to you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I'm going to ask that your eyes remain bowed in your heads. Your, your eyes closed and your heads bowed. And It's a public faith. If you said that prayer, you gave your life to Christ for the first time. You received him as your savior. Or maybe you're a prodigal. You're coming back to him. You realize you've been leaning on your own understanding and you've caused problems in your life and you want to change. Would you raise your hand this morning? Would you acknowledge that you've returned to Christ or that you've, re- you've accepted him for the first time? I can't see real well. I may have missed some hands, but we just thank you, Lord, for who you are and how much you love us. We thank you for the free gift of salvation. We thank you for the truth of your word. We thank you that you are there to counsel and instruct us through through your word. You're there to give us peace. You're there to provide your people as confirmation. Lord, we want to keep our word because you keep yours. We want to reflect your character in our lives. As we go out this morning, Lord, we uh, want to just give you all the honor and glory that you deserve. We want to just thank you for this day. We want to thank you for the truth of your word. And we want to ask that you would guide us, direct us to be lights in this dark world. So it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.